uh, he is uh, um, a, a chairperson of the chair of mathematical logic at the University of Sofia. Okay, please, Christo. Thank you, Professor Drensky. Okay, so today I'm going to speak about enumeration reducibility, but not only. Uh, I'll speak both about enumeration reducibility and Turing reducibility, which are the major reducibility investigated for the last 100 years, I would say. So Turing reducibility is almost 100 years old and enumeration reducibility is 60 years old. So I'm not going to so I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. I'm not going to, 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 to go into technical details. And I'm going to start from the beginning, at least from my point of view. So the beginning is computability. So computability started as a byproduct or not exactly as a byproduct, but something that, that emerged from Hilbert's program of, for the formalization of mathematics. So these were research, research that began in the beginning of the 20th century. And the people wanted to somehow formalize computation. What exactly is computation? What do we do when computing, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And during all these years, very different models of computation emerged. So we have the most popular one and maybe the best one, which is the Turing machines. We have recursive functions. We have lambda calculus random access machines and many others. This is not all of them. Well, the key feature of all this is that all of them, they lead to one and the same thing, which are the computable functions. Uh, well, the reason, one of the main ingredients why they all lead to one and the same thing, although, although they are very different in the approach to computability. The reason for them leading to one and the same thing, the main ingredient is the so-called coding. Now, in logic, coding is just an effective procedure defining an injective or better bijective. We cannot always define a bijective mapping from a collection A, which might be some mathematical objects or might be even not mathematical objects to the set of natural numbers. So given any element in A, we should be able to determine its code using finite amounts of time and memory. So this is the key feature. So it's a kind of algorithm which gives you, which maps your objects to natural numbers. And those natural numbers are called the codes of your objects. Here I have three very simple examples. So the first one is maybe the most general one. So suppose that you have an alphabet. I have chosen a very simple alphabet with just two letters, A and B. And you want somehow to code the words, the strings built from these two letters. Well, the simplest way you can do it is just to map the word x1, x2, xk. These are, uh, uh, these, these are letters to the natural number, the prime number p1 with degree s and x1, the prime number p2 with uh, degree s and x2, etc. And P1, P2 are the prime numbers and SN, this is the sign number of A is one and the sign, sign number of B is two. Of course, this is injective, but not a bijective, bijective mapping. Uh, the second example, second example is a more mathematical one. 
So you can code the tuples of natural numbers with this encoding. You just take M and N, and then uh, you map the tuple M and N to the natural number 2 to the nth multiplied by 2N plus 1 minus 1. So this minus 1 is because in logic we, uh, we treat 0 as a natural number. And the third example is given a finite set of natural numbers, this canonical code is just the sum of all 2 to the n, where n is an element of d. All right, so when we have this coding, what happens is that using the coding, you can simulate one computational model into the other just using the coding. So you can simulate recursive functions, lambda calculus, or lambda access machines with Turing machines, and vice versa. So you can somehow simulate Turing machines via recursive functions, or lambda calculus, or random access machines. So this is what happens when you do coding. So coding is something very important. And as far as I know, it should be attributed to Gödel. He, I think he was the first, well, at least if, if, even if he didn't invent it, but I, I'm pretty sure that he did invent it, he was the first to realize his power and make a great use of it. Now, coding is so important from my point of view that uh, uh, if we didn't realize the power of coding, we wouldn't have all the technological advance of the 21st century. So everything that we see now, so all, all these computer-based uh, technologies, they all rely to coding. Because a modern computer, it can do a lot of things. But if you think about its architecture, what it does, it somehow transforms natural numbers. So if you don't know everything, if you don't know anything about what I have said till the moment, you would, uh, you, you should not uh, care about this because there is a modern point of view to all of this. So the best intuition that you can have about coding is that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not about coding, but about computation. So a computation is so a computable uh, a model of computing or a computation is done by a computer with unbounded binary memory. So you, you can think of your uh, your computer or your phone or, or your tablet. It's one and the same thing. So this computer it relies on a binary memory. So everything is stored with zero and one. Now, your computer, what it does, it executes some programs, some executable files or algorithms. So, although if you're a programmer or whatever you want, you will somehow specify this programming, programming language, Java or C or something else, but when you do the compilation, uh, your, your code will be transformed into a binary string because all you can put in your memory is just binary strings and nothing else. And what is a binary string? A binary string is just a natural number. So if you want to know what is the code of your program, you just look at your memory, the binary string that sits there instead of your program, this is the natural number coding your program. And we usually denote it like this. So this is the algorithm or the program with code E. Every natural number E 
can be loaded in the memory of the computer as an executable file. Well, in most cases, it will do nothing or just crash your computer. Uh, so, in fact, this is the best coding or mapping to algorithms where, that you map your algorithms to natural numbers. What does the program do, actually? So, again, if you look at what happens on the level of the memory of your computer, the program takes some input and after the ex execution produces an output, the input and the output, output are once again stored in your memory, so they are binary strings and hence natural numbers. So what basically your computer do is when loaded some program, algorithm, executable file, whatever you want, what your computer do is to calculate a function with a domain and range consisting of natural numbers. So this is what happens. Now, because of coding, you can interpret these natural numbers in very different ways. So depending on the coding, what does actually this number means can have very different forms. So a natural number might mean a word, might mean a real number. Well, not, not of course, all real numbers can be coded. This is clear. Or it could be some um, text, or it could, it could be some picture, or, or whatever you want. So it depends on the coding. All right. But this is the intuition. So. This is the best intuition that, that you can get in the 21st century. The best, compu uh, the best computation model is your computer with its binary memory. The executable files are just some strings that can be executed as some natural numbers written in a binary form that can be executed from your computer. It takes, every algorithm takes as an input a binary string, so a natural number, and outputs and binary strings, so again, a natural number. So every algorithm or program is a function with a domain and range consisting of natural numbers. Now, usually, the domain of a program is not the whole set of natural numbers. So it is not defined for every natural numbers. Uh, the domain of a program is denoted by WE and is called the C set with index E. C stands for computably enumerable. Now, given a C set, WE, there is an effective procedure such that for every natural N it says yes if n is in w and it does never give an answer if n is not in w or to see this the claim that i uh, that, that, that that is stated here just compute e of n so input n to your algorithm if n is in the domain your computer will stop and give you an answer Otherwise, if it is not in the domain, your computer will go on forever and never give you an answer. Now, because you can access the positive information in this set, and you cannot access the negative information in this set, C sets are also called semi-decidable because you can decide the positive information and you cannot decide the negative information. Further, now why they're called computably enumerable? They're called computably enumerable because there is a computable subjection from the natural numbers to WE. How do we build this computable subjection? Just compute simultaneously E of zero, E of one, E of K, etc. Well, you'll say it's not possible to compute simultaneously all of this. Well, 
you just upload your program and let EF0 be computed. Uh, you give one step to the computer to compute EF0. Then you upload EF1 and give one step to EF1 and another step to EF0. Then you upload E2, etc. So you just do it like this. So like parallel computing. Uh, and then f of zero is the first natural number for which e gives an output and f of one is the second one f of two is this so because you compute this simultaneously so uh, whenever this is defined your machine will come to a stop and give you an answer and the first one which stops and gives you an answer this is your first element of w e then the, the second one that stops and gives you an answer it's your second element etc etc and now of course the set k which is just this one consisting of all natural numbers which are elements with the of the c set with the same indexes then is computably enumerable but its complement is not it's not the it's very famous this set it's called the halting problem because actually it's it, it uh, uh, in, in order to decide this set you should give an answer whether the the machine with so the, the algorithm with code e gives you an output when e is inserted as an input right so this is computability. Uh, it is, well, it is very important and uh, well, maybe we should have, we would have stayed here if it was not with the problem with the natural numbers. So what's the problem with the natural numbers? Uh, well, the problem is that uh, you don't, well, if you want to, to have a satisfying definition of what a natural number is, well, you should probably go to set theory or some very complex theory in order to define what a natural number is. Otherwise, if you try to define a natural number, not using set theory or whatever, then uh, if you make an attempt, then you will see that in order to define a natural number, then you should already know what a natural number is. So for example, you could try to say that a natural number is just a finite sequence of strokes. Okay, but what does finite mean? Well, finite means it, that you have a natural number which can be mapped uh, 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 right. So, uh, finite means that that you have a uh, that, that 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 you have a, um, a set or some well well. I'm trying not to use the, the word set, so a collection uh, which, which can be counted and in order to count you use natural numbers. So uh, you go in a circle all the time. So the best way, so because of this, maybe the best way in order to approach natural numbers is the axiomatic approach. So when you have an axiomatic approach then you don't care about the definition. You say that your objects, in this case, this are the natural numbers are your primitive objects. And you say, I don't define them, but I just postulate some of their properties, which are the axioms. Well, the best known axiomatic approach to natural numbers is piano arithmetic. Now, the problem is with piano arithmetic, 
as pointed out by Diodeo and then by, uh, well, I think it's Church, is that piano arithmetic is incomplete. So you can, the, the, there is a sentence which is true, but is not provable but by piano arithmetic. And from the computability point of view, the set of theorems of piano arithmetic is computably enumerable, but it is not computable. And further, every consistent ex extension of piano arithmetic is undecidable. Now, piano arithmetic and arithmetic is very important because it, it's actually the base of all mathematics. So every every particular branch of mathematics uses natural numbers. So it's very important for us to know the natural numbers. And what, what uh, these two statements, the sta statement that the set of theorems of piano arithmetic is not decidable and every extent, consistent extension of piano arithmetic is undecidable are very important issues. This means that we cannot use an axiomatic approach in order to, um, to understand every true sentence for the natural numbers. Well, now because of this, now, now here again we use coding. Okay, I, I hope it's clear that we use coding. So the set of theorems, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't mean here the, the, the expressions which are written in some formal language, but I mean the natural numbers corresponding to these, um, to these words using some effective coding. Now, using the effective coding, we can talk about the theorems of piano arithmetic and piano arithmetic itself using just natural numbers. So here we I mean the set of natural numbers corresponding to the theorems of piano arithmetic is C, but is undecidable. So the natural question here is, okay, it is not computably enumerable, but maybe it's quite close to be computably enumerable. Uh, so the question is, how do we compare sets which are not Computable, computable or computably enumerable. What's the way? How, how do we know that a set is more complex than another one? The answer comes with uh, another modification of Turing machines proposed by, by Turing, uh, which is computing with Oracle or relative computing. So from our perspective, of the computer, we allow the computer to use an auxiliary function, f, when executing a program e. Now, this auxiliary function is not inside the computer, it comes from the outside. So, you might think that during the execution, from time to time, your com the computer asks you, what is f of 1? And it is you that you, you should give the answer. Uh, Everything else is the same. And we denote the resulting fu function by this. So this is the, again, the, the algorithm with code E, which uses as an input the function F. This gives, gives rise to Turing reducibility. And we say that a set A is Turing reducible to a set B if the characteristic function of A is computed using the characteristic function of B, if there is a program E doing this. Now, this relation is reflexive and transitive, and every ref reflexive and transitive relation gives rise to an equivalence relation, which is the Turing equivalence in this case. The equivalent classes under the relation are called Turing degrees and the reflexive and transitive relation Turing reducibility becomes a partial ordering, all the Turing degrees. 
Now this partial ordering, the basic properties are that it has a least element, which consists of all the sets which are decidable. And for every two degrees, there is a least upper bound of them, which is given by this. So if the, de the first de degree is de generated by A and the second degree is generated by B, then the least upper bound is generated by this set A plus B, which contains both the information about A, which is coded in the even natural numbers, and information about B, which is coded in the odd natural numbers. Now, using this uh, reducibility, so this way to, to order somehow the sets of natural numbers saying that, of course, B is more complex that, than A, that using B, we can, we can know A. So knowing B means that we know A, just use this algorithm to, to, to derive A from B. So what's the, uh, uh, where does this PA, so the theorems of PA, where do we go, did they go? So, Well, I didn't write it down. Well, it turns out that PA is actually equivalent to the stop the halting problem K. In fact, the halting problem turns out to be more powerful than every C set W. So every C set W is Turing reducible to the halting problem, or if you want, to the um, theorems of piano arithmetic. Well, and now a natu very natural question arises here. Is there, is there a C set X which is not decidable and is not equivalent to the set K? Well, the problem is that there are no natural examples. So this is a problem proposed by Post in 1940s, I think. So there are, not na there are no natural examples, but nevertheless, Friedberg and Muchnik were able to construct C, set, C sets which are incomparable using Turing with disability and which lie in the middle of the least element and this element K. So, this is the, the first step in the degree theories. So, this was actually the very motivating uh, results for studying degree structures and degree theories. Uh, because this result was proved with a method which is called finite injury priority argument, which is actually a very nice argument. And because of this, uh, the scientists uh, began to take interest in Turing degrees and how this structure, uh, so uh, what is the behavior of this structure? What about enumeration reducibility, which this talk is actually all about? Well, enumeration reducibility arises some 20 to 30 years after Turing reducibility. And it goes like this. So an enumeration of a set A is just a surjective mapping from the natural numbers onto A. 
then we say that A is enumeration reducible to B if there is an algorithm which transforms every enumeration of B into an enumeration of A. And there is a, another one which is more technical, but as you, uh, as you can see, so this is the definition. Uh, I hope that you see my cursor uh, moving around. So this is the definition. Uh, the only thing that we use here from computability is actually the C set. So this definition is quite simple, more simple actually that that the definition of Turing reducibility. Here D U, this is the finite set with canonical index U, about which we spoke about a little bit earlier. Now, why do we need this enumeration reducibility? Why not stick entirely to the Turing reducibility? So enumeration reducibility was proposed in 1959 by Friedberg and Rogers. Uh, now, what, what's the difference between Turing and enumeration reducibility? Now, uh, as you can see, uh, enumeration redu reducibility is again a reflexive and transitive re relation which generates an equivalence relation. We have a least upper bound and we have a least element, this time consisting of all C sets. So as you can see, it's a little bit different than the Turing case in which the least element consisted of all decidable sets. Uh, well, the reason for this reducibility to be interesting, from my point of view, is that it is more, let's say, natural. Why should argue that this reducibility is more natural? So it is more natural when you, you're trying to talk about some natural processes. Now, if we go back to Turing reducibility, now Turing reducibility tells you that knowing the characteristic function of B, so you know all the information about B, then you're able to compute all the information about A, positive and negative. Now, this is very natural for a mathematician. We usually, when, when we take a set A, we don't think, okay, so now I have positive, I have negative information, etc., etc. We just know the set A, so knowing the set A means that you're able to determine whether something is in A or it is not in A. So this is what we usually, uh, so this is what usually a mathematician thinks when given a set. Well, but if you think about some natural process and these surjective mappings of these enumerations, now the enumerations are, you, you should think about enumerations like some um, well, some natural process and this N, so uh, the, the mapping, uh, the, the N, the domain is just, are just the moments of time. So F of zero, so you, in some portions of time, you get to know the set A because your enumeration tells you what happens in A. So at first step at zero, it tells you this is in A. Then in step one, it tells you that this is in A, et cetera, et cetera. So enumerations and enumeration reducibility, you might think that are, that are more bounded to time and hence maybe they're more uh, natural that uh, knowing the whole set A all the time. Uh, for example, this is what happens in mathematics. Uh, at every portion of time, you are given some theorems, but you will never know. So maybe 
there are some theorems that you will know that uh, some statements, uh, I'm sorry, some statements. You will know someday that they are theorems because they are proved. Some of them you will know that they're not theorems because their negation is proved. But then there are some statements that will never be proved or disproved. And so you will never know uh, what happens there. Uh, further, if, if you look at, at the everyday life, you know your history, but you don't know your future. So uh, the life itself is an enumeration. It enumerates some, um, so, You are ever growing experience. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I was searching for a word. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, well. Okay. So. Uh, right. So enumeration reducibility and enumerations are more connected to what happens, let's say, outside of mathematics. So Turing reducibility is more connected to what happens inside mathematics and enumeration reducibility are more connected to what happens outside of mathematics. Uh, well, what happens after this is that Turing reducibility, because it's older, is better studied. So, if you look at the amount of papers about Turing and enumeration reducibility, Turing reducibility is much more studied than enumeration reducibility. And, uh, okay, so uh, before going to that, I should have stated that there, there is this connection between Turing and enumeration reducibility, which is very important that a set is Turing reducible to be if and only if uh, this a join the complement of A is renumeration reducible to B join the complement of B. And the set A is computably enumerable in the set B if A is enumeration reducible to B join the complement of B. So you can see that somehow enumeration reducibility can simulate Turing reducibility and this relation which is computably enumerable in. Now the first line gives you a natural embedding of the Turing degrees in the enumeration degrees, which is defined just in this simple way. The images of the Turing degrees are called total degrees. And of course, here is a characterization of a total degree. Uh, a total a degree is total if, if it contains a total set. Uh, I'm not going into this. Uh, right, so as I was saying, Turing reducibility and Turing degrees are better studied than enumeration reducibility. And I think that this is mainly because of, um, of um, big, big because they were first invented. Now, Here is a little parallel between Turing and enumeration degrees. So uh, there are minimal no zero Turing degrees. The enumeration degrees, on the other hand, are downward, downwards dense. So there is a degree. In Turing degrees, there is a degree which is strictly be, be, uh, above zero, but between zero and this degree, there is nothing. And in, 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 in the enumeration degrees, this is not true. Every partial order can be embedded as an initial segment of Turing degrees, but every partial order can be embedded in every initial segment of the enumeration degree. So these are quite different results. So here is not actually a partial order, but of a semi lattice with least element. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not entirely correct. Uh, but uh, as you can see, they're quite different. They're quite different, these two structures. And 
why I have decided to mention this uh, partial ordering embedding. Now, this is because a partial ordering can simulate every structure in mathematics. So you can simulate every structure by a partial ordering. So I have chosen here a very simple example. You take the cyclic group C4, consisting of the complex number one I minus one and minus I. And in order to build a partial ordering that simulates, in which you can simulate the group C4, you have to somehow simulate the group operation. So the idea is the following. Uh, of course, the full picture is much bigger than this. I have just uh, decided to give you a glimpse of the picture. So for example, you have i times minus one should be minus i. And how do we build a partial ordering simulating this? So we put a maximum, so, so the domain of your structure, which are one i minus one and minus i, these are the minimal elements. These are minimal elements of your partial ordering. Then you have maximal elements you have maximal elements which, uh, which do the job of the calculation. So in order to know whether I, uh, um, what is the product of I and minus one, you search for a maximal element such that there is nothing between I and this maximal element. And there is one thing between minus one and this maximal element. So this is the way to distinguish between first component and second component of your multiplication. So this is the left-hand side, this is the right-hand side. And then what is the result? The result is the unique element, which has two elements between this maximal element and the minimal element. Using this technique, of course, you can build, so, so for every tuple one and i, you should build another maximal element. For minus one and i, you should build, an, build another uh, maximal element, etc., etc. But using this, you can simulate entirely this group. Actually, you can, using this technique, you can simulate every every structure, even the most complex one. Uh, you can simulate even the natural numbers. So, so uh, are, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. So, uh, are the lengths of the paths from, from the minimal elements to the maximal one, something like the Giotto numbers of, of the minimal elements or some, are they? The, the no, 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 uh, no, no. Uh, take it offline if it's not, if, if the answer is no. Yeah. The length of the paths just mean that if the length is, well, this is one. If yeah. the length is one, this means that this is your left hand side. If the length is two, uh, this is the right hand side. And if the length is three, this is the result. Okay, so, so this particular part of the diagram only models the uh, one uh, arithmetical equality, so to yes, say. Yeah, yes, and you. you should have all, yeah. all of them. Yeah. But, but, but the picture will be Good. tremendous. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's why I didn't, didn't put it here. Uh, and this is the reason that we care about partial orderings and how do they embed into the Turing and enumeration degrees. Now, uh, as you can see, the Turing degrees are very complex because every, well, as I, as I said, it's not partial ordering, but upper semi lattice can be embedded as an initial segment of the Turing degrees. So this is very strong, which means that the Turing degrees are very complex, very complex structures. So it means actually that you can embed 
uh, every countable power partial order, I should have said here. So this means that the Turing degrees contain as initial segments every countable structure in some sense. So it is very complex. Uh, on the other hand, the enumeration degrees, you can embed every initial segment, uh, you can embed every partial order into every initial segment. So it is like density. Uh, you might think, oh, density is much better than, than, than this. It's more complex. Well, it's not actually. Well, usually it's not. If you think about the rational numbers, the rational numbers are dense. Uh, and of course, every countable linear ordering can be embedded in the rational numbers. But the rational numbers as uh, ordering are quite simple. Uh, whereas, for example, the natural numbers or some uh, some countable ordinals are much more complex than the countable numbers, uh, the, 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 the rational numbers. So uh, the density is not a very, so, so it, it does not mean that your structure is very complex. Well, it turns out that both the Turing degrees and the numeration degrees are as complex as possible. They are computably isomorphic to second order arithmetic. Uh, and we further have this by interpretability conjecture, which says that for every degree A, the respective degree structure can correctly guess a generator, so a set standing in A. So this is done using some uh, coding of the natural numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the process is very, very complex, and I don't want to go into details. Uh, the B interpret interpretability conjecture is equivalent to the rigidity, the lack of non-trivial automorphism of a structure of the structure, in both cases. So this is the main question that stands before both of these two degree structures, uh, whether there is a non-trivial automorphism or not. Uh, and of course, there, there is a finite automorphism based for both degree structures. This is the best that we know for the moment. And all the research nowadays is centered about this question. So this interpretability conjecture. Now, uh, up to, uh, right, so this is about an operation that is called the jump. The jump is just the halting problem relative to a set. Uh, uh, you, uh, you have a Turing variant and then you have an enumeration variant. They, so this jump operation agrees on uh, Turing and enumeration degrees with respect to the natural embedding. Uh, now the jump is definable in the Turing degrees, uh, but the proof of this is very complex. So in order to define this, you, uh, you define the second jump of zero using some uh, coding of arithmetic then you define the first jump of zero, uh, and then you define everything else. So the, the jump of every, every element. Uh, well, well, why I'm saying this? Because till the 21st century, enumeration degrees were always catching up behind Turing degrees. So, uh, this was how all it happened. You had some result in Turing degrees and then you somehow transfer it to the enumeration degrees. So techniques and results were usually transferred from Turing to enumeration degrees. Now this all changed in the beginning of the 21st century when Kali Moulin uh, discovered this very attractive 
pairs of degrees. So a pair of degree is a Kali-Mullin pair if it has this property. So, uh, so this is like a super minimal pair. So A is just the greatest lower bound of the least upper bound of A and, H, A and X and A and Y for every enumeration degree A or X. Yeah. Well, as you can see, here is the definition. So Kali Mullin uh, did give a definition of the jump operation in the numeration degrees using these Kali Mullin pairs. And you can see that it's very simple. So here's the definition. A prime is just the biggest least upper bound of a K pair X, Y such that X is bounded by A. Uh, even if you don't understand it, or you cannot grasp the idea directly, uh, uh, as you see, this is just one line. And if we have to go to the definition of the Turing jump, it will be much more complex. Now, beside defining the first jump, kali in pairs turn out to be very, very uh, uh, helpful for building results which are not driven for the Turing degrees and even anticipate results in Turing degrees or prove something that cannot be proved in the Turing degrees. Now this is a result of this form that the total degrees, so the images of the Turing degrees under the embedding, the natural embedding, are definable in the enumeration degrees which means actually that the structure of the enumeration degrees is actually more powerful in some sense of the structure of the Turing degrees because we can simulate in here what happens in the Turing degrees. So we need to actually to investigate this one in order to understand even what happens in here. The, the other way around is not known to be true. So we don't know whether we can define somehow the structure of the enumeration degrees into the Turing degrees. This is not known. Further, this is a very important relation for Turing degrees, which is the relation C computably enumerable E in, is definable in the enumeration degrees and is not known to be definable in the Turing degrees. And further, using these techniques and of course something more, uh, there is a result here by Soskova and Slemon which says that this structure has a finite automorphism base consisting of total degrees below zero prime, then this is not known for Turing degrees. So as you can see, this technique of K-pairs, of kali pairs, of pairs uh, is very crucial for obtaining results which are quite different from the enumeration, uh, from the Turing degrees. So this is the step in which in the enumeration degrees began to have their own life, very different from the Turing degrees. And okay, I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the speaker. Do you have any questions or comments? Okay, Mitko. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Christo. Uh, uh, may I reveal that uh, uh, it was my initiative to, to invite Christo and I'm grateful to him for giving an elaborate, uh, balanced, and most importantly, self-contained lecture. Uh, and uh, th th this way, he sort of, I think, uh, uh, made us uh, uh, feel closer to the topic of, of uh, research of, of the group of uh, logicians in uh, Sofia University, which was my my uh, original idea and I, I hope this happened yes, and thank you Christo 
once again. Um, so, uh, yep. do you have any so, questions or comments? Okay, Mitko again. Yep. Uh, well, th th this is all that I want to say. It was a uh, well balanced, uh, self contained, eloquent introduction to, to the topic. I fully enjoyed it. I felt younger because I have done a little bit of this uh, as my, part of my undergraduate study. And I'm happy with what happened. Some other questions or comments? Okay, you have written thank you for us, but this is thank you for you. <laughs> so thank you. I want to make an announcement that the next talk will be um, the next Friday, but it will be at 4 p.m. Bulgarian time because the speaker, this is Rava Kosvukova, she's uh, in Brazil. And her talk will, will be some, uh, um, this is at the home page of the Institute, but you can see, of course, it in the moment. Um, I don't remember exactly, but it was something about groups and three algebras. Okay, 